What's up guys, War History Geek here, and welcome back to another new acquisitions video. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about items that were from January through about April of 2023. And uh, it's not a huge amount of items, but I think that there's some pretty good pieces in here. So let's just get right into it. So for starters, right here we have just a standard East German canteen. Uh, I picked this up for like five bucks off of a friend of mine, so I actually already have one, but East German stuff continues to get uh, more expensive, more collectible, more rare. And when you can get it for a fair price, you know, I always try to jump on it. So just another standard East German piece to add to the collection. Nothing too special there. Um, moving along, we have uh, United States Army Institute for Military Assistance, ST31-91B. The, uh, uh, the military manual for the Army Special Forces Medical Handbook. So something interesting here. This I actually got for free. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where it came from. Uh, it was left behind in one of my... You know, one of my lecture rooms um, at college, and nobody claimed it. I left it there for about a week, and it just floated around the room. So I uh, decided to keep it for myself. So that's how I ended up with this. I think it's pretty cool. You know, Special Forces stuff is always interesting, uh, and I'll just add it to the manual collection. Then moving along here, we have this one here, the CB Combat Handbook, um, NAFTRA 10479. You can see there is a print date of 1972 in the front cover. And it's pretty interesting. You know, it's uh, your standard handbook, Vietnam War era. Um, nothing too notable about it. I got a really good deal on it, though. I paid, I believe, like 4 or $5 for it because uh, a friend of mine, actually the same person who I picked up the canteen from, uh, bought it at a garage sale for next to nothing. So I didn't know what it was worth. I just offered him what I thought was a fair price. And it turns out that it's actually worth a, a pretty penny on eBay. Uh, this is not something that I intend to sell anytime soon. Uh, but it's one of those items that I'll hang on to it, and then if I do run into a situation where I need money for a, a bigger purchase or something like that, this will be one of the items that I go to be able to fund that. So, something interesting, Vietnam era, and uh, happy to add it to the collection for a fair price. All right. And then next up here, we have some paperwork that my dad actually got for me. He said he was at some antique store and saw it for pretty cheap. So, for starters, we have this ration books wallet, and uh, here you can see there's one ration book in there. Uh, for Marie Malafta or Malafa from Cleveland, Ohio. So just a, a standard ration book, nothing too special about it. Uh, but you can see that almost all the rations are still in there. It's only missing one sheet. And uh, I just thought it was a, an, a neat little piece. So something nice to add to the home front, could be a shelf filler or something like that. And then this one was particularly interesting to me. So here you can see on the front that it's dated 1942 and it's named for Laura A. Wolf, Cleveland, Ohio. So open up this big envelope here. We got a couple of sheets of paper. So here you can see we have the Department of State from uh, John E. Sweeney, Secretary of State for Columbus, Ohio, uh, dated December 31st, 1941. And uh, you can read that if you want, but basically it's talking about how, um, just thanking her for uh, being a part of Ohio and the work that she was doing. And then here you have a certificate from the quote unquote President of the United States uh, in recognition of her services to the nation and to her state on registration day. October 16th, 1940, uh, awarded December 31st, 1941, once again. And uh, this is just a, you know, a form holder. But basically, these two forms were certificates of congratulation thanking Laura A. Wolf for her help um, with military registration. I thought this was something interesting. I've never seen anything like this before. Um, my guess is that immediately following Pearl Harbor, there is obviously a lot of you guys know that there is a massive push for um, military service registration. So they needed to all of a sudden from, you know, fairly standard or low levels of uh, registration in the military to having to bolster a huge amount of staff to handle the, uh, the increase. So it's likely that she was a volunteer here in Ohio somewhere in the Cleveland area um, to help register all of these new people that want to join the military after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And these were certificates gifted to her for her help. Um, I haven't researched her too much yet. Um, but I do think that this is something interesting that I'm going to look into more. Like I said, never seen it before. Probably not high value, but super happy to add this to the collection. I've never seen anything like it. All right, so now we're moving on to some of the Japanese items that I got, actually. So for starters here, we have some Japanese trench art here made out of, uh, as you can see, the bottom, and I'll zoom in here, is a... Japanese artillery shell. It's from a Type 99 88mm anti-aircraft gun, and I'll have a photo of that up here as to what that looked like. Uh, as you can see, there's some of the markings on the bottom. Uh, if you can't make it out in the video, this has a Nagoya Arsenal stamp on it, so 
uh, very interesting. And the rifle round in the center is a uh, Type 99 Arasaka rifle round from World War II. So, as you can see, it's a really great piece. Uh, I don't see Pacific Theater trench art like this very often. It's very common for the European theater, not so common for the Pacific theater. Um, a friend of mine actually picked this up for me at an antique store over in Worcester, Ohio. I believe I paid like $20 for it, so a pretty fair price. Um, even with this broken tab here, uh, I imagine that I could probably get $50 for this or so if I wanted to sell it, but I think that this is just too cool of a piece to want to just resell. So I'm holding on to this for a long time. Um, these obviously were when they cut down the shell left and then bent down to hold cigarettes or cigars or whatever, as this is an ashtray. So I thought this was a super cool piece and I'm super happy to add it to the collection. Uh, it looks great on display with my other Pacific Theater pieces. And then coming up next, we have a really cool piece here. So a friend of mine who uh, was in the Marines, and this is actually the same friend who um, had that Fallschirmjäger helmet that I feature here on my YouTube channel. Uh, but he was in the Marines, and uh, really great piece here. He picked up a number of pieces of shrapnel from Hacksaw Ridge on Okinawa while he was there um, overseas, which I was super thankful for that he was willing to send these to me for free as a thank you for uh, working with that helmet and getting it to him safely. So this is perfect. He did All he sent me was the shrapnel. I bought the shadow box and uh, did this little write-up down here with some photographs of the battle and all that. Um, you know, just for presentation's sake, but these are some really cool pieces of shrapnel. Up here, we have two pieces of grenade shrapnel, from what I can tell, as they're uh, a little more specifically molded and a little thinner. And then all of these pieces down here are all artillery shell pieces. So it's really cool. Generally, I don't like, um, you know, like shrapnel and basically just rusty pieces of metal. But in this case, I really like this because I have the ability to, well... I have the ability to show pieces that I know for a fact were there involved with the fighting at Hacksaw Ridge, which I, I feel honored to be able to have these pieces in my collection, and they already look great in my display. So thank you again to my friend. These are some awesome pieces, and I'm really happy with how this shadow box turned out. So this is one of the cooler pieces I feel like I've gotten from uh, this time around. All right, and then next up here, we have some German pieces. So first of all, we have a uh, Deutsche Arbeitsfront book here, and I already have one of these in my collection, but once again, it was the same friend with the shrapnel and the Fallschirmjäger helmet, and uh, he was looking to get rid of some items, and he was looking to get rid of this. He offered me a very, very fair price for it, so I decided to take it off his hands and uh, add it to my collection. So you can see there's not a ton filled out in here. Um, you can see a lot of personal information, and then the pay stamps starting in 1935, and then carrying on through, let's see here, early 1944. You can see that he stopped paying in May of 1944. Uh, so, yeah, a neat little piece. Not anything particularly rare or super valuable, but super happy to add this to the collection. I love these personal pieces like that. They make a great display piece. Now, moving on here, this is probably the most expensive and then also most historically significant item. So this is a Reichstag referendum ballot from 1938. So a little bit of background on this piece. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen this. It was originally listed on the Gettysburg Museum of History website, and it's also been listed on a few other places. But this referendum ballot was issued to the Reichstag in 1938 after Adolf Hitler annexed um, Austria and made it part of the Reich. And this referendum ballot was for the Reichstag to vote on whether or not they were either going to vote ja or yes for Hitler and support his move to annex Austria and make it a part of the Reich, or vote nein or no and strike down his action and uh, return Austria back to a sovereign nation. So as you can see, this ballot was voted yes, um, and obviously you can see this funny discrepancy between the ja and nein uh, circles. You can tell that it was very much biased towards one particular direction. but. This is an all-original one. There's two different versions that I've seen in my research, and um, I can post a published picture, I'm sorry, a, uh, a translated picture of this up for people to see. But this is a really great piece. I believe I paid around $165 after tax, and I think that that's fair. You know, some people might say with an item like this that that's way overpaying, um, but this was something that I had happened to have on my list for a long time, considering buying it from the uh, Gettysburg Museum of History website. And then um, actually at the beginning of the summer, in the first week of May, I took a trip 
uh, to Gettysburg, and I found this in a local antique store. My guess is that it was probably the booth belonging to the Gettysburg Museum of History that they were renting out in the uh, antique store uh, down in downtown Gettysburg. But this, I felt super happy. Here you can see the back. There's nothing on the back, but super cool piece. Super happy to add this to the collection. Um, I couldn't tell you how rare this is. I'd imagine a lot of these types of things were either thrown away because they had no use to be kept, or, um, you know, they were eventually destroyed after the war, you know, between the bombings in Berlin, uh, the destruction of Berlin and all that, and then this tie to Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party, having this around probably wasn't a great idea. So super happy to have this in the collection now. Um, and it's already, again, it's making a great display piece. I have this uh, on display sometimes. I try to cycle it because I don't want this to be out on display all the time to prevent fading and all that. Uh, for the time being in this plastic sleeve, it's in my archive. But super cool piece. I hope you guys enjoyed seeing that. And um, I'm probably going to do a more in-depth video on this piece specifically and the history of that event. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right, and then we have our last piece here for this new acquisitions video. Uh, it's a pair of World War II German winter uh, guard duty boots, uh, also known as sentry boots. So in World War II, uh, especially going into the East, you know, they didn't think ahead. That's a common thing that people know about the Germans is that they didn't think ahead for the winter months in Russia. Well, this was something that they had developed. Um, it's the uh, wintertime sentry boots. Now, of course, you have the combat winter boots, which I can put a picture up here. And uh, those are kind of like the standard jack boots, except they don't have hobnails on the bottom. A lot of them had just plain leather or rubber soles uh, as the cold would travel up through the hobnails. And then they also have wool around the top of it rather than leather. Now, these, unlike those combat boots, were designed to be worn over um, either the standard or wintertime combat boots. They're slightly bigger, uh, and they were designed for you to be able to slip your boot inside of them. And like, the, like I said already, these are meant for sentries. These were not meant for people with combat roles. These were meant for people that were going to be standing out in the cold and snow for long periods of time uh, and needed to insulate their feet a little bit better. So this is what they came up with. Now, of course, in Russia, uh, when it came down to it, a lot of these types of sentry boots ended up being used as combat boots because, you know, they just made do with what they had. And especially towards the end of the war, um, in the winter of 44, you know, stuff like this would have been used in a combat role, but that's not originally what it was intended for. Uh, I got a really good deal on these uh, from a vendor of mine that I go through a lot. I've bought a lot of things from him. And, uh, you know, I think I paid like $80 for the set of these, and I think that's a fair price. You know, they're in a little bit of rough condition, but I think that they're a very cool piece, and I think they're going to make a great display piece. Um, now, as you can see here, unfortunately, it looks like it had a name tag in there at one point. Um, there's, I can see 1940 something. Unfortunately, it's just so faded, I can't really make it out. Uh, my guess is that these were probably used even after the war, and that's why they're in a little bit of rougher shape. Uh, but you can see here, here's the remnant of the other tag there. Uh, you know what, that actually says 1940, so you can see that that is a item from 1940, which is super cool. I actually hadn't noticed that until now. And taking a look at the bottom, you can see the leather sole, no hobnails. And taking a look at the back here, you can see that it's strapped uh, shut on the bottom. And I'm not going to undo that because of how fragile the leather is. Um, but overall, a really, really cool piece. Um, I got this in a bundle as well, which made it even better. So uh, that's all for this new acquisitions video. If you guys enjoyed, make sure to hit the like button. And when you're in that area, hit the subscription button and notification bell. I have plenty of other videos just like this coming in the near future, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I'll take this opportunity again to apologize for my inconsistency with uploads. Um, you know, of course, with college and I have an internship and everything else, uh, it's just very difficult to, you know, sit down and be able to film videos and then edit those videos and get it uploaded on a decent schedule. For So for you guys that have been sticking around and staying tuned for my content, I really appreciate it and I'm really glad that someone else can appreciate some of these items with me. So uh, that's all I have for this one. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.